Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. My name is Angelica Espinosa, and I'm currently serving as a CHCI Wilson Family Foundation Education Graduate Fellow. It's such a pleasure to be joining you all today for supporting our educators' breakout session. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank our sponsors, American Federation of Teachers, Apple, Dell, KIPP, and National Education Association for their support of this session. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, Representative Teresa Leisure Fernandez, Congresswoman representing New Mexico's third congressional district. Hello, everybody. Buenos dias, le de Dios a todos ustedes, y gracias por estar aquí. Uh, con nosotros, okay, how much, how many New Mexicans do we have in the house? Woo! Woo! I want to give a shout out, not only to, I think you're going to be the moderator of the panel, right? Yes. I am only going to be a, give a few remarks, but I want to give a shout out to our own president, Mary Para Sanchez from New Mexico, who is in the back of the house. You know, I am so very lucky to represent New Mexico's third congressional district, and I describe it as a beautiful and beautifully diverse third congressional district. We're a majority minority district where we have, you know, a whole bunch of Latinos, and then also 20% of my district is Native American. And it is, um, you know, both of those groups understand the importance of education as that key, as that key to make the difference in our lives, in our communities' lives. Uh, you know, I am so I am so grateful to everybody here. I'm grateful we have a, for, uh, a, a, a former intern here as well, because I, you know, we like New Mexico is represented. You find us all over the place. We're a little <laughs> state. You know, part of what I'm talking about is small places do big things, mm -hmm. right? And small like places do big things everywhere. And what happens? in that classroom makes big things happen in people's future and that is what educators do. I am a I am a Head Start baby. I always like to start talking about my academic career as starting in Head Start because that's where I fell in love with learning. And I want to make sure that all of our children can fall in love with learning. But I fell in love with learning actually as also as the daughter of two educators. My mother didn't want to be an educator because she saw how hard her mother worked. My grandmother was started teaching with a high school degree because yes. it was, okay. you know, small communities, rural communities, if you had a high school degree, you could start teaching. And my mother always saw how hard her mom worked that she never wanted to go into teaching. But they kind of, she did, eventually got a degree. We were, we were children. She'd fall asleep on the typewriter and the little numbers of, on the typewriter would be imprinted on her head. And, and so she eventually did become a teacher herself. And what she fell in love with, she fell in love with the miracle that happened when her students started learning to read. And she wanted to recreate that miracle for the rest of her life. And that is what you all do, right? You all help create a miracle that is completely within our ability, right? We are, you are miracle makers. And isn't that a wonderful thing to be? And my mom understood after she like participated in this miracle making activity of, of helping her students le learn to read that she never wanted to leave that. She became a uh, pioneer in bilingual education in Northern New Mexico. And, right, right, and she and my father helped pass the very first 1973 Bilingual Multicultural Education Act by which Tewa, Tewa, Toa, Navajo, Apache, Keras, and Spanish were started to be required to be taught in schools, right? And she always looked at how important it was to take not just the teachers, she would take the assistant teachers with her to Mexico and all over the place to sort of support that bilingual education because she knew those assistant teachers needed the support as well. And I think that that's what we're talking about today, right? How do we support the teachers? And sometimes it's by making sure they have enough support in the classroom, 
Uh, and sometimes it's by doing things like a bill that I am going to be introducing tomorrow, uh, which is uh, the Loan Forgiveness for Educators Act tomorrow, because the bill will address the teacher Ooh. shortage. <laughs> yeah. It's not, a, we don't want to wait 10 years. We don't want to wait 10 years. That's a little long. Remember, everybody you know, if they, <laughs> the public loan forgiveness, it's October deadline coming up. Everybody needs to get that. But that is a 10-year window, right? And so what my bill will do was say, no, if you are in public education uh, through K through 12, uh, an early childhood educator's uh, loan, is it will be forgiven after five years of service. And so we're gonna introduce that tomorrow. And that's, that's really key because we know you, know, you guys know all the statistics, right? We are overrepresented. Uh, we are overrepresented in the classroom, right? Uh, in New Mexico, 64% of our children are Latinos. But even in a place of it, right? But even in a place like New Mexico, which has such a strong tradition of, you know, Latino educators, Hispano educators, we are still only 37% of the teachers in the classroom. And that is simply not why. Right. And that's in New Mexico. When we look nationwide, you know those those statistics are horrible. Like only 9% of our teachers, our Latino in the country, when we know that Latinos, we might not be the majority my, uh, ethnic group right now, but we are going to be because we keep increasing. We're close to 30%, right? We're at about 28% now. So we know we need to support our Latino educators in New Mexico. Every single one mm -hmm. of our universities is a minority serving institution. In my district alone, uh, I have nine Hispanic serving institutions in my little district district alone. I have a big district. You know, it's a huge district. But we have to like get resources to those institutions. And I can tell you, I sit on the I sit on education and labor, which is why I'm not moderating, because I've got to go sit in committee uh, right now, is we are doing what we can to direct more resources to those institutions, because we need to make sure that we are teaching the teachers of our children. Because without that, es la cultura y idioma y herencia. We need to have make sure that our children are so proud of who they are. Because when you are proud of who you are in your own cultural uniqueness, then you welcome, then you welcome the diversity of others. You do not fear it. Because remember, they are trying to get, and they are trying to make sure that we are afraid of somebody who is not like us. What we need to do is be curious about somebody who is not like us. Because, oh my God, isn't that a wonderful journey to learn about somebody who is not just like you? And when you are confident in who you are, your own integrity of cultural identity and ethnic identity and language identity, then you are more likely to be welcoming and curious of somebody who is not. And that's what we do, and that's what you do. And so for that, I stand up here to just tell you muchísimas gracias. I give you gratitude for all the work you do. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative Fernandez. We appreciate your time and all that you do for our communities. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Becky Pringle, the president of the National Education Ooh. Association. Becky is a fierce social justice warrior, defender of educator rights, and unrelenting advocate for all students and communities of color, and a valued and respected voice in the education arena. A middle school science teacher with 31 years of classroom experience, Becky is singularly focused on using her intellect passion and purpose to unite the members of the largest labor union within the entire nation and using the collective power to fulfill the promise of public education. Join me in welcoming Becky Pringle. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Good morning. <laughs> hey, there we go. Uh, it is. Can I just say, 
you look beautiful. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. It is so good for us to be together in person, um, uh, celebrating all that we have accomplished, uh, reaching out to each other um, to make sure that we have the support that we need. Um, but just being in community yeah. after two years, um, welcome to CHCI. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. We are here. Um, uh, let me, uh, of course, uh, thank Angelica for that very generous, there she is, <laughs> generous um, introduction. And of course, the Congresswoman. Oh my goodness, Congresswoman Fernandez. Um, uh, she mentioned something that I want to emphasize. First of all, I need to thank her for the bill she's sponsoring around loan forgiveness. So uh, we need your support in, in ensuring that the steps that we have taken so far are just beginning steps, right? So what she's doing is incredibly important. I'm going to be joining Secretary Cardona this morning. If you see if you see me running past you in the back, I'm heading up to Pennsylvania to sponsor a public loan forgiveness event with Secretary, Secretary Cardona because he understands how important it is to make sure that we not only attract educators to the profession, but we keep them in the profession and don't drive them out because they can't afford to pay their loans and take care of their own family. So uh, we need uh, your support in continuing to do that. Of course, our, our CHI uh, president, I want to honor uh, Marco uh, Davis for the incredible work that he has done in the partnership uh, with the NEA. I am so um, excited that you have joined us in this space. Um, on behalf of the three million members of the NEA, I welcome you. I am prou uh, proud that we are a sponsor of this event, and I, I, I just need to give a, a shout out to my uh, to my sister, uh, Miss Evelyn, over there on the end. I know she's <laughs> fabulous. You'll hear you'll hear more about her uh, later, but she's the executive vice president of the AFT. But she is an NEA member. Yeah, yes, I know, absolutely. right? Oh, you get a twofer in Evelyn. Um, uh, but um, I'm so proud that she is joining us in this space. And this young man here, you know, he just got off a plane. Um, um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and this is going to be a treat that Jose is joining us in this space. Um, such an incredible partner for us at the NEA with our community schools work. So um, I'm so excited for those of you that haven't had an opportunity to meet him that you'll get, get that opportunity. Um, I don't need to tell you uh, the critical work that is ahead of us. And for those of you, any two, two or more people who stand still long enough to listen to me, and that's you now. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I um, uh, laid out a vision for the NEA when I became the president two years ago that we would unite not just our members, but this entire nation to reclaim public education as a common good, as the foundation of this democracy, and then transform it. Yeah, give, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. But, but we can't stop there. Because we have to transform it. That's what we have to do. Into something it was never designed to be. A racially and socially just and equitable system that prepares every student. Mm -hmm. Students that look like you. Students that look like me. Every single student. Everyone. To succeed in this diverse and interdependent world. That is the work that we must do together. So I can't thank you enough for joining us in this space. Um, I would encourage you to not only leave this session, but to, to take advantage of the opportunities to attend other sessions, to push your thinking, to challenge others, to gain new insights, to build relationships and make connections. Mm -hmm. So when you leave here, you understand this is just the beginning of the work that you uh, will do together. You know, um, years before she founded the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta was an educator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her words are as powerful and as relevant today as the day she spoke them. What she challenged us with is this. Every moment 
is an organizing opportunity. Every person is a potential activist. And every minute of every day is a chance to change the world. Woo! That is what we have been called Woo! to do together. So please, as you go out to um, uh, not just the sessions, but you go back home, embrace those words and remember that you have been called, you have a responsibility mm -hmm. to be worthy of our students. Thank you so very much for joining us in this space. Please soak it all up, take out your notebooks, write, reflect, and let's get to work. Sure. Thank all you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Becky. Now, it is my honor to introduce our panel moderator, Jose Munoz. Jose is a director of the Coalition for Community Schools at the Institute for Educational Leadership. Jose joined the Institute for Educational Leadership in 2017, bringing over 30 years of cross-sector partnership, experience in youth, family, and community development. Jose earned a National Legacy Award for his work leading gang prevention, intervention, and re-entry programs for the Boys and Girls Clubs, and he is also a founding member of the Southern Nevada Community Gang Task Force. Please join me in welcoming Jose. Great. You got me mic'd up there? All right. You guys can hear me? Yeah. And thank you so much, for, uh, Becky, for the kind words. And uh, Becky was just on stage with me in June in Los Angeles in front of 3,500 people, right? There you go. I also want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Initiative for just putting together such a thought-provoking conference. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> for addressing some critical issues. Some critical issues we're facing today. And, and sorry that the, um, our congresswoman from New Mexico couldn't be the moderator. So it's tough being a fill-in. <laughs> and it's this. tough following both of these acts right here after mm -hmm. those right there. So let's give them another round of applause yeah. too. Woo! Straight from the plain seats crowded to the hot seat on stage. <laughs> That's where I am right now. So um, a little context, I'm a senior vice president for the Institute for Educational Leadership. My role, main role, is the director for the Coalition for Community Schools. And I am so proud to say that the NEA and the AFT not only are still current supporters after 25 years, they're part of the originators of the Coalition for Community Schools. So I wanna thank them for that and for the many other partners and members and participants uh, for the coalition. We have one big vision to go along with, with Becky's vision right there. We really do see schools as becoming the centers of creating flourishing communities where folks feel like they actually belong to their community, that they're working together, and that everybody's thriving. We really feel that public schools are the key vehicle to make that happen. And so our big goal is to transform all public schools into community schools. With the start back in actually the NEA offices in 2018 was developing a big goal, 25,000 community schools by 2025. So we're in hot pursuit of that. And this conversation is right on time. It, it is way overdue, I would say, about supporting our educators. My mom was an educator for 33 years in Chicago Public School District and in Clark County School District in uh, Las Vegas. I have to say this because people outside of New Mexico don't understand why I always say this. Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh -huh. Because there is a Las Vegas, New Mexico. Yeah. So if you, so you want to go gambling, go to Nevada. But you can come to New Mexico if you want to see some great sights. Mm. So I want to say that and just to build off of that. Yeah, we're small and mighty, us New Mexicans in here. We're the, actually, quick trivia, or actually quick, quick fun fact, we're the fifth largest state in the country with about just over 2 million people. So lots of outdoor space to do. So this context right here, let's say about eight years ago, about eight years ago, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, I'm a first, first of all, I'm a, I'm a husband and a father of five. Father of five, uh, now adults, they're no longer children, as my oldest is 31 and I have two grandchildren now. Uh, but 
eight years ago when my 22 year old daughter was just starting high school, uh, she came home one day and she was pretty sad and she was kind of stressed out. We were just talking about what's going on. She's like, I don't know why anybody would want to be a teacher. My, my friends don't respect them. <laughs> and I said, and they have, they seem so stressed out. This is a 14 year old. And I remember making a commitment eight years ago. I said, baby, <laughs> one of these days I'm gonna do my best to try and change that paradigm mm. where teachers are the most respected position in our country. So <laughs> coming full circle, yeah, yeah. from a 14 year old. One more current context within the last two weeks, I've had two phone calls while traveling in my travels. Uh, one on the way here on my layover while I was in Dallas and one last week when I was traveling back from another site and two different places in the country. I have a big prayer, big hairy audacious prayer uh, this, this year is that there'd be no school wide shootings. So, so join me on that if you could. But the sad part is that there I was reported two individual shootings. One, one young girl, one 12 year old girl on her way to school being shot in the chest. She's recovering in Asheville, North Carolina. Who would think, right? Mm -hmm. An another, right in Baltimore, Maryland, as I was on my way here, was shot on the school grounds. Still no deaths yet, so thank God for that. And then it made me reflect as I was on my way here of this past weekend and celebrating the first responders from a tragic incident of 9-11 and realizing that what we all know, our young people, especially our young people of color who live in poverty, who have disabilities, who are involved with juvenile justice, are facing emergency day in, day out in their homes and in their communities surrounding their schools. And we have an expectation for them to learn. So with that, and then even the recent surveys that brought about this, we talk about 90% of our American educators right now are pretty much stressed out and leaving in mass numbers the profession. So supporting our educators is, is the most important thing that our country, as, as I reflect on my mom's career teaching in the projects of Chicago and remembering taking in children and families who are experiencing homelessness in our own homes taught me what support actually looks like. So in this conference, I want you all to realize that everybody in this room and your friends are all first responders for our children or should be. So to honor that in the, these two shootings that just I know of, and, I know, and it's sad to say that there's probably lots of others that are happening individually across our country. I'd like you guys to pull out your social media, pull go ahead, pull out your phones, and honor two things. Want to honor this conference, but also want to honor and you all to commit, if you're willing. Start a new, another little challenge, kind of hashtag I'm responding. You know, it's like, and then take pictures all year about you responding, but go ahead and tweet out that hashtag I'm responding. Take a picture of this great panel uh, right now and say I'm hashtag I'm responding at hashtag C H C I H H M 22. So that's hashtag C H C I H M 22. Let this be the moment where you take your remote working jobs if you have one and get out somewhere and volunteer in a school, go hang out near a bus stop, walk the walk that kids have to walk to school, roam the halls after you get your background check and pass that roam the halls, uh, uh, pick the weeds outside the fences of schools, and together, let's all be first responders in making schools the most irresistible place. When you have kids of five, when they bugging the heck out of their parents, I need to get there. Mm. And not only so, but for their parents to say, I need to get there. So let's all be first responders in that. So I just wanted to start off and just kind of just put some context on today's conversation. So I want to, we have a great conversation we're going to talk about supporting our educators with a great panel here. And I'll do my best to do brief introductions after a 
the studying you all on the plane ride over, <laughs> on the over. So uh, first we have right to my left right here, uh, Anthony Graves, who's the Managing Director of Partnerships and Innovation of the University of Colorado, Denver, where my oldest daughter lives now. So I have to come up there and visit you. I'll be there the first week of October. <laughs> and Anthony he actually plays a leading role, I love this, in developing of CU Denver's partnership strategy where they are actually uh, framing the university's vision to seed an open innovation district mm -hmm. in downtown Denver. So welcome, Anthony, if you would. Thank you. Uh, next to him, we have Evelyn De Jesus. How are you doing, Evelyn? Uh, Evelyn has been the executive vice president. Oh, no, sorry, down at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going right here. Down at the end, Evelyn Jesus has been the executive vice president, as Becky talked, of 1.7 million members of the American Federation of Teachers and is the first Hispanic officer, Latina officer for the union in its 106 years of existence. Um, I, I, thank you. Give her a round of applause this. It's been a long time, but I'm here. <laughs> Evelyn, I just want to say this. I love this in your bio right here that uh, you're a native Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. who grew up on the New York City's Lower East Side and proud to be the mother of two daughters and abuela Abuela to five grandchildren. So give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> I'm just starting off with two. Woo! Let me work my way back this way. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Tara, is it Natras? Natras. Natras. I say, yeah. like, you know, I always want to roll something. Yes, being, you got to roll that. Up. Being, yeah, roll, <laughs> roll that. Natras. So Dr. Natras is the senior education strategist at Dell Technologies, supporting educators in meeting their goals as they reinvent learning. I love that. Reinvent, let educators reinvent themselves, right, in learning. Uh, she's an experienced educator herself with multiple roles in education from school sites to administra administration and administrations. And, but she's focused on limiting some opportunity gaps and ensuring that every student is engaged in meaningful learning experience. And there's some opportunity gaps for our Latino and Latina educators as well. So well, let's welcome Dr. Tara. Mm -hmm. Now, last but not least, we have Sheila Ruiz with us, who's the Director of Social Work but for KIPP New Jersey. And as that, right. yes, as, as that, she leads a team of school social workers and develops school-based trauma-informed and inclusive mental health resources for students, families, and teaching staff. So I think that is extremely important for this conversation, your expertise in this. But what I love, too, about pulling out the, the bios, which I may need later, because I accidentally that's a long story. Went on an eight mile run today. Oh, trying wow. to get here. Long story later on. But I may need your licensed yoga instructor <laughs> later on. So we'll talk about that. So let's welcome again our very distinguished panel. Let's kick off this, let's kick this off with a big question. And Evelyn, if I don't mind picking on you being representing 1.7 million educators around the country. So big big picture wise. Just what are, what are you seeing, what are you hearing from educators across the country as that relates to this 90% of them being stressed out, especially two years coming out of a pandemic when they were had to be on Zoom screens and expected to have a good attendance. Yeah. So what, what's, what's happening? So first of all, I wanna say, I don't wanna be gloom and doom. I think we know what's out there and we know, I think what the pandemic has shown us is the really in, the inequality and the inequity of what has really, we knew it all the time. Our people knew it all the time. People that look like us knew it, but I think it just exposed it to the nation. That's number one. But I, I am a positive thinker and I just, everything's happening out there. What's happening? Gun violence is happening. Stress out teachers, parents are anxious. Students are anxious to go back to school. But the good news is as, as my, my president, Becky Pringle says as one of her members, we have to look for hope. We have to look because if we continue with what is not going right, how are people going to go back into the profession? How are these teachers going to go back into that classroom? So I just want to give you a sense of hope and where we're at. And what's happening, yes, there is anxiousness. There is uncertainty because of what you said, the two shootings, and we hear this. The polarization and the politicization of public education has a lot to do with it. But we are not gonna, we are not gonna give up hope and we're gonna continue to do what we need to do. Teachers are stressed out. Yes, they are. Why? Because they're not being supported they, the way they need to. They're not giving voice. They're not being paid what they need to get paid. So how do we come back from that? 
So what we're doing at the AFT is we're doing, we know what children need and what communities need. So we're doing a multi-year, multi-million dollar project on also reading opens the world, but we're going into schools and we don't believe in banning books. We believe in giving books. We believe in bringing joy and literacy back into the classroom. We believe in giving resources and not just books, but books that look like us. We've been all over the nation. If you follow me, I have been from California to New York, from Florida to Oregon, giving out books. We have children that say, my God, this book just looked just like me. The joy of reading, the joy of literacy, the joy of knowing what we need schools that are well ventilated. We need security in the schools. We need raw resources for our teachers. We need to know that the community and parents, look, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of extreme politicians that are trying to break us up and, and divide us. We're not about that. None of us are. We're about building community. As you said, my brother Jose, community schools, bringing community, parents, bringing things in every language. Because um, I also am president of NABE, the National Association of Bilingual Education. And one of my goals in that role as AFT executive vice president and as CHCI, one of the board members here, is how do we have people that look like us have a voice like never before, a voice that we will never go away. We are the majority, guys. But the issue is how do we become the advocates for the, we are the defenders of democracy. I wanna, I wanna really um, pre impress on what you said about I am involved, I am, you know, and what Becky said. We are the defenders, we are the custodians of this future and we have to move in a way, you have to be that advocate for that child. Teachers are stressed out, yes, but how do we come together? We come by going into schools, knowing what teachers need, knowing what students need, don't tell anybody I'm gonna ban this book. We have to teach honest history about what happened to Asian Americans, what happened to Latinos Americans, what happened to the LGBTQ families and, and all of that. And that's what they're preventing us to teach honest history. And we will defend any teacher that chooses to do that. So teach, thank you. <laughs> we have to show our kids that what happened before is not gonna happen again. And teachers have to know that they are supported by their community, by their friends, by their parents. And I, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I call myself Diva Nana because I refuse to associate. <laughs> but the issue is I, my children, my grandchildren are, we call them Chiniquas, they're Asian, Chinese, Boricua, Dominican. And my other grandson is Norwegian, Puerto Rican, Dominican. So my house, we have rice and beans. We have every, every you know, lo mein, every, everything is about diversity. Teachers also, how do we retain the teachers to become? Why would you want to step into a classroom as a Latina, as a Latino? Why? When all you hear is, teacher, we're banning teachers. We want them to have guns. They can't choose books. They're banning books. No way. We are giving you the books and the resources that you need to continue to do the right and justice work that is called upon you. Being a teacher is a calling. It's a calling that many of you know because you've been in classrooms. Public school is alive and well, and we are gonna stand with you, NEA, AFT are gonna stand with you together, making sure that we get the resources we need and we get the voice that we need and we put our pantalones on and know who we are. You, I tell everybody, I told Becky this morning, put on your, straighten out your crown and walk into that classroom, know who you are and know that you're responsible for every single child in that classroom. So I know what's out there, but public schools are alive and well and they are thriving and they're moving. And parents now, we did a survey, 79% of teachers and parents love public schools. So we know that they believe in us. We just have to believe in ourselves and we have to know that we're here to stay. And that and the most important thing is that we are the defenders of democracy and the custodians of this future. Thank so you. I appreciate that. I, I know, thank you. Yeah, so, so Tara, let me turn to you because of the things I picked out, Evelyn, what you were talking about and resourcing teachers the right way. And uh, Tara, in your bio, it talks about teachers reinventing education. How does that play in your work for what, what Evelyn was just describing, what's happening in classrooms? I think it's about doing it together, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about first responders and everyone being first responders. That also goes to the teacher in the classroom. So we know over the last several years that our students have had so many different experiences, right? Some were disconnected from learning for an entire year. 
Some had tutors and learning pods. And so as students came back into the classroom, it became a very wide swath of what students had experienced. And so if we are expecting teachers to come into the classroom and be one teacher with 25 or 30 or 35 students who have had such differing experiences, we're asking them to do something that is very, very challenging. And if you look over the course of the last decade, we've added more and more and more, right? We're gonna focus on SEL, we're gonna focus on mental health, we're gonna shift what's happening with reading instruction, we're gonna think about how we teach computer science and all of these things that are incredible for students to know and be able to do. How do we ask that one teacher to do it? Mm -hmm. And so part of reinventing what's happening in schools is bringing teachers together to do it in teams, to rethink what is the role of a teacher? So if you look at some of the models from like opportunity culture and thinking about what that looks like, it's Advent organization called Public Impact in North Carolina to also build opportunities for teachers to teach in teams, to say, you know what? We're talking about competency-based learning for students. These are the things that I'm really good at. These are the things that I can do well as a teacher. So I'm gonna partner with these three other teachers and we're gonna share that group of 100 students. And we're gonna have the social workers, and we're gonna have the counselors, and we're gonna have other teachers to come together to build this community. So when we talk about reinventing, we have to really think about what that day-to-day -day classroom looks like and what's happening with teachers and students, and then provide them the resources to do it, right? So as an education strategist at Dell, we work with schools and districts all over the country, and we saw Lots of folks now have devices, right? We were not in one-to-one -one situations in districts prior to the pandemic. Now we are. We're focusing on broadband. We're not there yet, right? We have a ways to go. But now that we have devices and we have broadband, what does that mean, right? How are we supporting teachers in using those resources and families in using those resources? And so we're doing a lot with digital inclusion and we partnered with ISTE to provide digital literacy resources to teachers, right? Because right. now it's a, okay, we've got all this. How do we make sure we know how to interpret information and evaluate information and building out programs that support teachers and students? So there's a lot when we think about reinventing, right? But it comes down to what are we thinking about in terms of teachers doing the work together and not that isolated one teacher in one classroom, but really building communities across the school and then making sure people have the resources they need to do the work, whether that's focused on digital literacy or reading or anything else. Yeah, you, you take me back to my childhood when I visited my mom's classroom. She was, no offense to any other kindergarten teachers, but my mom was the best kindergarten oh, teacher. I don't know. I don't know. I'm you know, so she, she won't see this video, I don't think anyway. So, but because of, I remember how she facilitated yeah. partnerships within the classroom. My mom was also, uh, my two, two of my five children's kindergarten teacher. Wow. So I have participated in that yeah. as a parent as well too. Awesome. So everybody, awesome. everybody who came that day had a role, parents and kids as my, one of my daughters was elevated to first grade within six months because she ended up facilitating too many groups of learning herself. Yeah. As you get to cheat when grandma's the teacher. But, <laughs> but the schools that she taught in and the schools that I get a chance to visit when I get to travel the country, um, there's so many issues that young people are facing. Yes, the safety issues, but some of the, the mental health challenges that they're yeah. facing that plays on that weight. So I wanted, Sheila, what, what are some things that you have experienced and maybe some ways that we can work together as we respond to these young children and, and, and the, support the educators themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the pandemic has definitely exacerbated mental health mm -hmm. concerns um, that have been present before pandemic. I think the pandemic just brought it all to the surface for everyone, right? Not just kids, but for adults as well. But for kids, right, it's, it's a lot different, right? Uh, a six-year-old is not going to be able to say like, hey, Mrs. So-and-so or mom or dad, I'm feeling depressed, I'm stressed. They don't have the vocabulary to express themselves. So how are they expressing themselves in the classroom? It's gonna be through behavior, right? And then that has a trickle effect on the teachers and everyone else in the classroom. So we might hear that there has been 
a, an increase in negative behaviors in the classroom. Kids are having a hard time sitting still, right? They were two years, probably a year and a half if they were lucky, at home on a Zoom screen um, for five, six hours at a time. And we're talking about little kids and even our, our teenagers. Um, and they lost a lot of learning time. Right. So now they're returning to the classrooms um, and they're having a hard time adjusting, right? They are missing being home. They're missing the flexibility. They don't really remember how to connect with other peers outside if they were lucky, right? You had siblings or, or communities. So we're seeing all of that in the way that kids express those emotions. And that directly impacts our teachers, right? So now you have a teacher, as you mentioned earlier, with 20, 25 students in the classroom. And let's say 10% of those kiddos right there are having a hard time adjusting. Now the teacher is trying to deliver a lesson while also trying to be responsive to seven different needs in the classroom. And I think in order to support, I always, um, at KIPP, we always talk about working in community and it takes, a, it takes a village, right? It takes a village to support our students in the classroom. It takes a village to support them in our own homes. So one of the things that is so critical is being able to build relationships with our students, build relationships with our parents, our teachers, our community providers, and as a school, becoming a bridge. Um, oftentimes, many communities have a ton of services available to families. They're not easy to access, right? And if I'm a parent or a teacher who is in distress, I don't need different hoops, fires, hoops to like jump through to get what I need, right? The minute one door closes, I'm probably gonna be discouraged and just feel alone. I can't, I can't do this, so I need to figure it out myself. And as a teacher, if I'm also distressed and I have a classroom full of distressed children, I'm not gonna be productive. I'm not gonna be my best self in delivering the best lesson. So really as a school, as administrators, being that bridge, connecting with the community providers and saying like, hey, we have a lot of students that have lost significant loved ones due to the pandemic. Can you come in and do grief groups for our kids? Can you do that for our teachers and provide and leverage the school? Because oftentimes where our community schools are places that feel safe. Um, and so families are gonna flock to the schools. Kids are already there. So if we bring services to our buildings, we're gonna access that many more students and families. It sounds shameless plug like community schools that need it more and more. Uh, where's where's our congresswoman? No, she's a, don't worry, I plugged her before she left, <laughs> before we started. Um, so far, all three of you all, Anthony, leading up to your strengths. So as, as the fill-in moderator, reading bios, I was, this plays in perfect. Had you guys no time to prep. It's just mm -hmm. how the good Lord works, huh? But I hear a lot of partnerships, a lot of innovation happening uh, from a services standpoint to eliminate barriers teachers may ex experience that have the desire to care for their children as well as teach our children. So thinking of an innovation district, you have a unique position on this panel right here because you work at a university and you're strategizing this greater partnership and creating an innovation Absolutely. district. What could happen or what could that look like when we think about supporting teachers across a geographic region, whether it be one or more school districts? What does that look like from your perspective? Jose, that's a great question. First of all, he's doing a great job filling that's up here, right. don't you think? Ooh. I think right off the plane, he's doing wonderful. Thank you for that. So I appreciate the question, but first, just a little context. First, I want you all to know that my mother was also a teacher in public schools. So she actually was a special education teacher. And I have these vivid, thank you. I have these vivid memories of her going out on her teacher's salary, buying supplies and doing things to the kids in her classroom to ensure that they had the best possible educational resources to move things forward. And even now, you know, as a guy who's lucky enough to be married, who has a daughter who's just started the third grade in public school, I still see the other side of the sacrifices and contributions the teachers make every day. And to Shayla's point, it takes a village, you know, a community to support students. It also takes a community to support teachers. And that's what's really exciting about the work that I'm doing at the University of Colorado Denver or CU Denver. CU Denver believes that education should work for all. 
You know, 50% of our students identify as being students of color and we are an aspiring Hispanic serving institution. And so when I think through the partnerships that we're trying to architect, we think critically about how we can bring together the public and private sector to create pathways that will directly benefit diverse students, right, who are going to come through this educational system. And so I'm very excited actually to announce today for the very first time a special initiative that CU Denver is leading to build an innovation community for K-20 education, whereby, yes, it's really exciting. So we are partnering with three school districts across the Denver metro area who are fully committed to doing three things. The first is to diversify the teacher pipeline, right? Understanding that not only do we have a national teacher crisis, a shortage, but we really have a terrible shortage of brown and black and other teachers, right? That directly impact educational outcomes, right? And the way that we move our society forward. The second thing that we're going to move forward through our innovation district is we're going to really work to upskill teachers to give them digital literacy, right, and tech education. And the third thing we're going to do is to really create this robust, diverse tech talent pipeline. And we are, we're going to do that in partnership with Apple, who has emerged now as an incredible supporter who will be deploying a generous product package, scholarships, professional support, we just understand that effectively what we really want to do is we are using our School of Education and Human Development at the University of Colorado Denver to look at these really cool concurrent enrollment programs where we're going to give high school students credit towards teaching degrees while also embedding digital pedagogy. So teaching them, right, how to use the coolest, app, uh, newest Apple tech to look at swift coding and the everyone can create curriculum to ultimately give students exposure to these pathways for STEM education that will create the high paying, high mobility jobs of the future. Wow, let's give him a round of applause for that. Wow. Uh, I, I wanted to say, because I just be my bio, I geek out on those types of partnerships too. I was like, can I come play? You know, that's, <laughs> a, someone, that's what I wanted to say. But something you were talking about, especially the technology piece uh, for our children. So I have a hard job. I just got back from Hawaii. Working, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> yeah. Not working, but I, I was visiting very rural schools in Hawaii, Wainai, Honaunau, Kohala, uh, Mountain View. Uh, and these are like places where you can't even get a school bus right. to drive some of these roads that aren't developed because uh, investors bought the property and they fight with the local governments so of who's going to prepare the roads. Meanwhile, kids are getting lost. But there's a, there's a unique opportunity from my next, sorry, make people jealous, trip is to go visit very rural places in Puerto Rico in, in October. But in, there's, there's a unique opportunity with technology that this COVID-19, this pandemic did bring about, is you don't have to leave your bedroom if you have the right infrastructure and right capacity. And, and, and Tara, you talked about this too. How is it important to reinventing schools and education, and anybody can answer this, how is important technology is, is in the mix? It provides opportunities for students and for educators that weren't there before. Right now that we are tackling devices and we are tackling internet, and I'd be curious with all of those rural locations you've gone to what the broadband looks like, right? To make sure that everybody has that. Not access. good. Right, so that's part of the issue, right? And that's something else that we really need to continue to tackle, but it provides opportunities. So when the pandemic hit, I was working with a lot of CTE teachers from across the country. And they said, how in the world are we gonna do automotives remotely? What are we going to do in order to teach our computer science classes and our hospitality classes or those where we need labs and now we're off site? And so I got that question a bunch over the course of five or six weeks. And I was like, you know, we just need to get together and talk about this. So we pulled 12 CTE directors together on Zoom and said, what are you all doing to solve this? And that was in June of 2020. They said, can we meet again in July? Because we're getting ready to do this weird hybrid thing and we don't know what it's going to look like and we need support. And so I said, of course, we can meet in July. Then they said, can we just meet every month until we ask you to stop? That group grew from 12 or so CTE directors to now over 70. We built networking groups for people teaching cybersecurity courses to middle and high school. So thinking about that tech pipeline, mm -hmm. we have over 120 
districts represented in that group. We're doing it for virtual and hybrid schools because now not only are we seeing what some of the impacts are of the pandemic that we need to overcome, we also saw there are opportunities for kids to learn in ways that we weren't thinking about before or that people were afraid to try before, right? And so now we have opportunities for flexibility where some kids can learn in person, some can learn hybrid, some can learn online. And what does that mean for teachers who need the support in that area? So we have virtual networking groups where teachers and leaders come together once a month from all over North America and say, here's what we're doing for our hybrid school. Here's what we're doing for our virtual school. And so technology allows for connections that we otherwise wouldn't have, right? We wouldn't have someone from New Mexico who's working on a cybersecurity program talking to someone in Virginia who's doing that, except for at an annual conference. And now they do it once a month and they can share resources and do the things that they need to do. And that builds community, right? You're not the only one, because some districts, there's one cybersecurity teacher, right? And now actually there are lots of us all over the country and they can work together. Yeah. So oh, go ahead, please. it's a game changer. I, Becky, I love where you're going with that. One of the other things that I would note, especially as we talk about the importance of technology in the classroom, technology directly connects to the wealth gap in the United mm -hmm. States. If you look at recent information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology, we need to produce over a million STEM workers for the next 10 years in order to remain like a, a global power. I was, I was hearing that, and yes, when I was in Hawaii. Like yes. How many people, yes. Right, and so in order to do that, we have to really think through how we are preparing our students in this K-20 pipeline, mm -hmm. right, for those STEM-focused jobs in the future. And we cannot do it in a vacuum. That really requires the public-private partnerships, right? To have public education coming together with higher ed, to bring in the private sector with companies like Apple to really move this forward, because this is a heavy lift, especially as we're trying to afford students opportunities in the future. And let me let me change up one one thing, just a quick. I'm just changing up the schedule a little bit. I'll stick us to 11:30. But Evelyn, I, I did want to come to you because what does this mean? I know you're going to say something, but in, with, within your comment. What does this new opportunity in technology mean for educators, preparing educators and supporting them uh, themselves, especially those what I just witnessed in remote places who can't drive to the University of Hawaii, and like, but, the, but still, how does, how does, what does the importance of technology mean for them as well? Well, of course it's, it's important. I, I, as my sister said, people that weren't able to maybe connect will connect. My, my, this is just on a personal note, not as an AFT EVP or Move anything. the hat. Right, I'm moving the hat. It's my abuela hat on. And I think it's important. So I have four grandchildren by one daughter. All four have IEPs, which is special needs, not severely. But what I saw, and I'm just going to go to what you said, the social and emotional piece. I agree with what you're saying, the CAP 20, CAP 20 and all that. But we have, I think the biggest focus for teachers right now, how do we differentiate in that virtual world? How do we, so I have one granddaughter, the eldest one, she's a social butterfly. She did terrible during the pandemic, terrible. Then I have the second one, which has severe dyslexia and emotional issues. She soared to a 98. So that was a surprise to us as an educator, as, as a grandma. So I think of one of the biggest pushes now, yes, we do need, but presence is important. People coming together, it's the social emotional piece Yes, we want to produce great citizens. We want to produce great workers, but we also want to produce great human beings. So I think the big issue right now is how do we move that agenda technology-wise, but how do we balance it to make great citizens, great human beings, and emotionally stable? Because I find when I, and I'm in schools all, all the time, if you follow me, many of the children now, the, the anxiety that's happening just going back how, they don't want to go back. They just like, I'd rather, as you say, stay in my pajamas and be in my back, you know, in my room. So I think the biggest, I think it's a great thing that we're connecting. And I think it's, it's going to bring opportunities, like you say, a teacher in New Mexico with a teacher in New York. That is fine. But I think the big challenge right now is going to be how do we promote that? How, that's what you said. The work is how do we do professional learning so teachers how, know how to differentiate in that way. It's a new world and how do we build those strategies in the professional development for teachers and for students? Because differentiation always was in the classroom. Now it's in the world. How do we, how do we curtail that and make it 
um, productive for our students and our teachers. And, and we talked a lot about the, the importance of being in place together and the importance of partnering together. And many of us who work now, we can do this across Zoom screens, but presence, presence is important, especially on our alls, psyches and Correct. social and emotional well-being, just to be in place together. Becky was alluding to that. Uh, Shayla, how does technology play into this when you're working with students and working with educators themselves too? And I'm really specifically looking for supporting the educators as this panel was talking about, because I know we talk about supporting students and their learning, but how do we support educators using technology? What does that mean for their own social and emotional well-being? Absolutely. I think technology has been a blessing, mm -hmm. right? Um, I always joke around before COVID, I could barely turn on my laptop without support. And now mm -hmm. I want to apply for the IT team. I was like, <laughs> I, I could do this. Um, so I, I think it's been really wonderful in terms of, you know, mental health and just health in general. Like we have telehealth access, you know, and that is enormous. There are well visits are happening now. They weren't happening yeah. consistently for, for our teachers, right? Because you're, mm -hmm. you're going in in the morning, um, you're prepping after the kids are out, you know, preparing for the next day. And if you have children on your own, then you're gonna you know, go to your second job and do that. It's no time to go to your annual visit to your dentist. And now with telehealth services, for example, you can do that as a teacher. Um, it's easier for parents to leverage technology also to access those supports for themselves and the kids. Uh, there are so many social emotional learning curriculums that are available also via technology. Oftentimes it could be a situation, you're a teacher in a classroom delivering a lesson and perhaps you have one or two students that are just you know, not actively engaged, something is happening they can pull out their Chromebooks and perhaps they're going to open their SEL program and you're just going to go to them like, hey, why don't you work on lesson one? I know you're not here right now. Try this. This is going to help you focus on whatever it is that you're developing. So it's an additional tool. And for some kids, it's fantastic, right? For those more introverted kids, for some kids, that doesn't work with them. And that's fine, right? right. It's another modification tool in our teacher toolbox, in our parent toolbox. Um, so it's, it's incredibly helpful in that sense. Well, thank you. And, and we all need someone to talk to at times everybody. when we're stressed out that tech. Let me just ask this. I want to give everybody a 30 second closeout of just a brief summary on the topic of supporting our teachers. But before I do that, as you all think about that, in the audience, who, who, who is a teacher in the audience? Just raise your hand if you are. Keep that hand up and raise your other hand. Thank you. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Keep, keep, that, keep that hand up if you're also a parent. Raise the other hand. Raise the other hand if you're also a parent. Look, look around. Wave your hands because that's going for a ride. <laughs> we talk about all the issues from teachers and parents are going through. That's a ride right there. So technology can be a huge yeah. lever for supporting our educators uh, and our children but it also could be in supporting ourselves, our social emotional well-being. And with that, let me just give, if, if I could, uh, Evelyn, if I could start with you and come this way, but like a 30 second. Okay, summary. so I just wanna talk about, we did a, a, a survey, we have a task force on um, here today, gone tomorrow, and it's about teacher retention. And we have more copies if you want it. And it's important to read because it talks about what teachers need. Exactly, you know, better, of course, better salaries, but it talks about shrinking teacher pay penalty, diversity, the, the educator workforce, grow your own programs, as my brother said, lowering class sizes, curbing the nation's test and punish, the obsession with standardized testing and reducing endless paperwork. We don't even talk mm -hmm. about what teachers have to do with all that paperwork. So if you're interested, we have it there. We also have another program with the national another uh, report, National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators that the AFT, we partnered with state legislators, Latino state legislators, and we sat with them per, you know, per um, president and per state legislator, per state, and so much great conversation came out. They said, I never knew this about AFT. I never knew it, you know. And so we were able to converse because they're the ones that make the policy and they're the ones that make, you know, what we do. So that was very, so we have both reports for you and I, I hope, you know, they're great and please read them. And I'm just happy to be here. And you know what? We're all on the same team. As, as Becky said, we're all on the same team. We see things maybe a little different. Like I advocate for present and being in public school only because that's just where I come from. But 
I agree with the technology piece and what we need to do, but I also want to take a pause and make sure that we do it correctly. It's not about just getting data or producing. It's about making sure that during the journey, we have our great moments and our teachable moments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Building off of what you said, I think it's bringing teacher voices into the decision making too, Absolutely. right? When I was talking earlier about reinventing learning, that shouldn't be happening at the federal level, the state level, and even the district level without teachers being involved in yep. what that looks right. like, right? And so that voice piece is one that I think is key to retention, right? When other people are making decisions and it's impacting you and you're like, well, wait a minute, what happened, right? And that's happened to all of us as teachers. So thinking about how we do that redesign together. And then also those public-private partnerships matter. I mean, they're resources, right? People think about Dell as, well, they've provided a device. We also have digital literacy Correct. resources. We also have programs like Girls Who Game where students are authentically solving problems. And you know, we had a teacher who wanted to implement Minecraft and was trying to figure out, it's like, we have a program for that. Don't go reinvent the wheel, right? Like go look and see what's out there because we all have to do it together. It goes back to what you were saying earlier, right? About everyone being responders and doing this work together. So. Thank you, thank you. A round of applause. <laughs> Shayla? Actually. I echo those sentiments um, and, and would add that allowing for space and giving teachers the opportunity to check in and bring emotions mm -hmm. back to the work place is so critical. We often talk about, you know, I'm going to go to the classroom and I'm leaving my stuff at the door and I'm going to show up for my kids. However, that's not realistic, right? Like we're people, we come with feelings, we have all feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, so really allowing, giving teachers space and opportunities to share how are you feeling, what do you need, because if they feel safe and have those relationships, they're going to be vulnerable and be able to share and specifically say, this is what I need. Oftentimes we can spend a lot of resources bringing in interventions for our teachers and they're all the wrong interventions, mm -hmm. right, because we weren't asking them. Um, so ensuring that they feel comfortable and they feel seen and heard as people first, right? You can't pour onto another cup if your cup is empty. If you pour onto your cup, you're pouring into the cup of every single student and every single parent as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please, sir, close this out, Anthony. Well, well, first let me just express gratitude to all of my colleagues here on the panel. I feel lifted. I feel like my cup is fuller now. All right. <laughs> right? After hearing from you three, and you know, Jose, you've just done a marvelous job today. Thank you for that. You know, just for you all, I would just remind you that you are powerful in the connections and networks that you bring to the problems in education, the way that we can support teachers. Just know that whether you're a teacher yourself, a parent in the classroom, a community leader, somebody in the private sector, you know people and can pull folks together to start solving for issues that improve the experience for teachers and strengthen the public school pipeline for the children who are there. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Big round of applause for all of our panelists. I wanna, wanna thank you all. I failed at my first job is the end on time of that. You did a great job of moder moderating me, but uh, if you would, please. Please, uh, hashtag CHCIHHM22, CHCIHHM22. What I heard most was together, but make sure that we lean in and listen to our teachers if we want to support them of how that support should come. So let's all just go out there and make sure that we are responding to our local kids and to our local teachers when we go back home. Defenders of democracy, remember, <laughs> defenders of our children. <laughs>